detection strategies, custom tools and tactics for detection response containment. That's a long title. Um, I want to start out by getting, hopefully getting a show of hands from people in the crowd. Does anybody here work alerts as a part of their day job or at all during the week? Like you go through and you're clearing alerts. Okay. All right. Good. Good. We've got a few. All right. So I'm going to take you guys back to 2011. Uh, new guy on the job. I got hired to do uh, it was like a developer slash detect guy. Um, two weeks on the job, I decide like there's just a ton of really awesome security tools at this place, and decide, you know what? I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go find APT all by myself, right? <laughs> so, and we have a, a phrase for that now, right? We call that hunting. I'm gonna go hunting for APT. So I start digging. And sure enough, like almost right away, I find something. And I was like, all right. So you do what you do when you get that initial thing, right? You get that thing. I'm going to tech guy. I'm going to take that thing. I'm going to start digging on it. I'm going to look at it. I'm going to pull out little pieces of this and that. I'm like, okay, I know what that is. I'm going to go over here. I'm going to look in this tool. You know, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to um, build the case that what I'm looking at is malicious. And the more that I did that, like the worse that it looked. Like it was pretty obvious to me that... I was looking at something bad, possibly a compromise. So uh, I went to my manager and I told him about it. I said, hey, I think I got something going on here. Told him, told him what I had found. He said, uh, go talk to the Intel team and see what they say about the things that you found. I said, all right. So I went over to the Intel team, showed them a few of the things that I was looking at, and they're like, dude, you found that? That's like really bad. And I was like, all right. So go back to my desk and... I'm new, right? I'm two weeks into the job, so I don't want to like throw this out into the air and be like, look what I found. And you know, I know it turns out to be nothing. I'm like, uh, all right, fine. So I dig and I dig and I dig. And I spend about two hours on this. And at one point, the, when I'm looking at the, the data that I'm looking at, I realized that the things that I'm looking at had just occurred. And I was like, oh. like my hands started shaking to get that real excited. You know, I, I found something, you know? And, uh, and, and it was happening right then. Like, Oh my God. So I think, okay, uh, I'm a detect guy. I'm responding. Next step is escalate, right? You get escalate the alert, get people involved, get people looking at it. So I was like, all right, what do I do next? Uh, all right, who is it? Who's, someone's clearly pwned. So I, I go and I, and I look and I dig out. And at, at this place uh, where I was working at, they had numbers for IDs. So I pulled the number out and they had a tool that you could uh, put the number in. And it would show what that person did for the company. So I was kind of hoping, and as a detect guy, we have kind of a, a backwards uh, view on this. We kind of want it to be something crazy because you want to find that, that clever, crazy hack. Um, I was kind of hoping it was like a scientist or something that was working on the next cool thing. Or maybe it was like some high up at the company, like CEO or something. Like two weeks into the job, I find APT on CEO's laptop. Oh, man, what is this? So I get in it, and I put it into this tool. And it turned out that I was investigating the traffic of myself, <laughs> investigate my own traffic. So of course, all the things I was looking for, I was finding them. I was like, this is happening right now. <laughs> Two hours of my life gone down the tube. That's how it goes. Uh, I am John. I work for a company called Ashland. Uh, we're an international chemical company. We got about 10,000 people and about 15,000 assets. Ashland's a fun place to work at from a cybersecurity perspective. We kind of run the gamut of uh, uh, what we have to protect. So we've got scientists working on the next cool chemical thingamajig. So we've got intellectual property, which is the target of APT. We've got a retail side. So we've got point of sale systems that we need to protect. Uh, we've got industrial PLC type stuff going on, which will probably be more important in the future. Um, this entire presentation is going to be about false positives. Probably the most boring thing you could think of to have as a topic for a security presentation. 
And what happened was um, I got to thinking about false positives, and I came across this idea. And once I had this argument with myself on whether or not my idea was even legitimate, that idea turned into a, a postulate, I think. And I could use that postulate then to... Oh, okay. I hear it when you move. It seems to be. But this is. Yeah, it's that one. Yeah. It's, it's somehow dragging across the clothing. Okay. Come on, take it off the um, that. Put it up here. And put it on. No free. <sighs> and hopefully that one doesn't pick up like that. Yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so. Uh, I, I came up with an idea, and it turned into a postulate. And based off that postulate, I've come up with a detection strategy. And as a part of that strategy, um, I come out with a tactic of which is to develop a custom security tool. Because that's what I do. That's what I've always done everywhere I worked at. I write new custom security tools. So I, I, I want to ask for a show of hands, um, just kind of a rhetorical question. Did you ever have that time as a detect guy and go back to when maybe you first started where you were working that alert for a really long time, like maybe even hours, if not like the entire day, and you were so sure that you had the most clever hack you've ever seen in your life detected, only to have like the senior analyst or whatever come over and point out some really obscure artifact at the very beginning of your analysis and be like, dude, that's a quality scanner. <laughs> How'd that make you feel, right? I did that to somebody one time, and I feel really bad about it. <laughs> so I, I, I started out thinking about what, what do false positives mean to me as an analyst, as a detect guy. And to me, false positives are just like a fact of life. I've got this long list of alerts that I need to go look through and look for the bad guy. And along the way, I'm going to see a lot of crap that I'm just going to toss out. And it's just like that's how we do our job. But then I started out by asking, I try to ask myself, what do false positives mean to management? But that turned really into this question, how are false positive metrics used to drive behavior where you're working at? So let me explain what I mean by that. Going back to previous job, um, what we would do is we would look at the false positive metrics always as a graph. And that graph would always be a line chart. And that line chart inevitably would always look something like this. It was always trending up every single time. And what we would do is we would all get into a room, put this chart up on the projector, and we'd uh, look at the data behind it, and we'd say, hey, look, it's trending up. It can't keep doing that, because eventually there's going to be so many alerts generated that our analysts won't be able to keep up, and we're going to miss stuff. And we'd all nod our heads in agreement and say yes, and we'd go about trying to figure out some way to get that graph to go down. And that's all logical and it makes sense, right? That's the right thing to do. Something always bugged me about that. Not so much bugged me, but it felt like this graph was trying to tell me something else and I could never figure it out. And, and that was that. So fast forward um, till recently, I was thinking about this and then and something popped into my head. And I was like, it seems like going back and looking through all the detection, all the alerts that I've gone through, in my lifetime, it seems like a lot of them are false positives. As a matter of fact, I might even say it seems like maybe even most of them are false positives. Maybe 99% were false positives? Maybe? I don't know. So when I was thinking about that, what I do when I problem solve is I'll, have, I'll argue with myself, essentially. That's why you see me talking to myself sometimes. Um, so I get to do that on stage in front of you guys now to try to Prove my point. I said, okay, John, I think that 99% of all the alerts I'm looking at are false positives. That's interesting. And I thought, well, no, that's probably not right, because think about all those IDS alerts that you got going on. There's so much stuff going on on the perimeter every single day. I've got thousands, if not tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands, depending on how big your business is. You got people running network scans, vulnerability scanning, SQL map through Tor exit nodes. How, how many WordPress vulnerability attacks. There's just all kinds of things going on, and I know that that's going to drop that 99% down to something else. There's just a ton of stuff. And I said, yeah, that's probably, maybe my idea is crap. Then I said, you know what? 
If we're using a metric to drive behavior, then we need to make sure that that thing that we're measuring, we have a really good definition of. So then I asked myself a very simple question that I thought I'd be have a like a quick answer to, and I didn't, and that surprised me. I said, so what is a false positive? That's easy, man. A false positive is an alert that turns out to be crap, right? And I was like, yeah, that's, that's a horrible definition for something. <laughs> What is crap? Well, it's an alert. You know, it, turn, it turns out to be nothing. What's nothing? It's, it's an alert that's not a false positive, right? All right, how about this? It's an alert that was a malicious. It's, it was malicious, right? OK, all right. Let's think about that for a second. Let's think about some examples. Let's say you get an alert, and it comes from snort or sericata or something like that, and it was based on a regular expression, right? And you look at the signature of what the, uh, the, the author was trying to detect, and you see, okay, I understand what he's trying to do here. And you look at what you actually detected, and the regular expression matched something that the guy obviously did not mean, intend to detect, right? That's an easy one. Okay, false positive. Here's one. Somebody just tried to hack into your corporate network with a WordPress vulnerability attack. Ah, but I'm not running WordPress, so I don't care. But that was an attack, right? Whether or not you meant to or not, that was something that you were looking for, and you found it. There it is. It's an attack. It's a malicious attack. If you had been running WordPress, you'd have a problem. Right, but I don't care, right? So that's that paradox, and that's why I can't answer the question, what is a false positive? I don't really know. So I thought, you know what? Let's, I, okay, I got, a, I got a definition for it. As a detection guy, I think, every time I look at an alert, every time I assess an alert, I am always going to come to one of two conclusions every single time. I'm either going to respond to this alert or I'm not. Right? You guys agree with that? All right. So that's interesting. I'm either going to respond or I'm not going to respond. doesn't matter if it's malicious. As a detect guy, you come in and you attack the network with a WordPress vulnerability attack, and I'm not running WordPress, I really don't care. If I were an Intel guy, I might care, right? I might put that source IP address in a list and track it or, you know, publish it or sell it. But <laughs> as, as a detect guy, I really don't care. I'm here to respond, and if I'm not going to respond, move on. So now I have a definition of what a false positive is. A false positive is an alert that I'm not going to respond to. And if you take that definition of what a false positive is and apply it to that idea I had, all of a sudden it makes sense. Because if I, look, if I think back and I look at it, and I've looked at a lot of alerts, how many of those did I actually respond to? I bet it's 1%, if not less than that, because I've looked at a lot of alerts. So with that definition now, I think if I understand what a postulate is, <laughs> I'd never even heard of the word before, and I was like, hey, that makes sense. A, <laughs> a postulate, uh, I, I think I have one, and that's this, that 99% of all the alerts are false positive. Now, what I'm going to do, because I'm old school, I'm going to tape this up here, because I'm going to keep referring to it, because I'm going to make all these... Um, uh, observations based on assuming that this is true. So I'm going to keep pointing at this. 99% of all alerts are false positive. What does that mean? If that's true, then I already know ahead of time, when I go, before I go to look at those alerts, that 99% of them are going to be false positive. I already know that. When I'm looking at a alert, I know that I have a 99% probability that what I'm looking at, I'm probably not going to respond to. That's interesting. And when I realized that, and I accepted this as a postulate, I started changing my thinking about how I'm detecting. So what does it really mean? Does it mean that 99% of my intelligence sucks? Does it mean that 99% of my signatures are horrible? Does it mean that 99% of the time I'm actually wasting my time? <laughs> or more, go back to that graph I was talking about where I was going up. Does the metric even matter? Like, does the number of false positive even matter? Every time I've gone through this slide, or through this pitch, or presentation, <laughs> I've had trouble transitioning from this thought to the next, so bear with me on this. Does it matter how many false positives there are? Yes, it absolutely does. As a matter of fact, it ends up being the most important thing in the strategy that I came up to do detection. And consider this. 
If, you, if 99% of all the alerts you're going to look at are going to be false positive, if you were to chart your graph of all the alerts, that's going to be 99% similar to your graph of the false positive alerts. So why is that important? That's important because only 99% of the alerts you're looking at are false positive. There is actually 1% that is not. So there actually is something to find, and we all know that. What you're looking for has to be in the form of an alert, right? Because that's what we do. We, we review alerts. If we're going to find something, it's going to have to be an alert that we review. And that alert is going to need to be in that list of alerts that you're going to review. And in order for that e alert to even exist, the chance of that alert even happening depends entirely on your coverage of the attack surface. So follow my logic here. Let me, let me explain this one a little bit. I'm sure most of you guys already understand this. As the attacker comes in, he's interacting with your systems, just like what Harlan just talked about. And as he touches all those systems, those are touch points, those are the attack surface possibilities that you have if you had a tool to detect on that point to detect the attack, right? So as you're going through, like, and there's 100 points to detect on, if you're only detecting on one of those points, your chances of actually detecting this attack are less than if you had uh, maybe 50 of them covered which would be less than maybe if you had 100 of them covered. I think that logic makes sense. The more coverage you have of the possible attack service, the better chance you have of attacking that sophisticated cyber attack. And it turns out that the wider coverage that you have is going to turn into more alerts, of which 99% are false positives. We already know that now. So now, Go back to that graph I was talking about, that graph that was, that was going up. Based on what I just said, I'm thinking, I need that to go up. That should go up. As a matter of fact, that should skyrocket if I want to detect the attack. But we know that's not exactly true because my original logic is still sound. If there's too many alerts, our analysts can't keep up with it, and we need to tune it back down. So I want to talk about this concept of hunting and tuning. And it's not new, it's what we call it at Ashland. And it's where um, uh, a hunt is where it's kind of like signature development, I guess. It's where you're going to go and you're going to look somewhere for that bad thing, like I was talking about. It's hunting for APT. I'm going to go look, you know, say I'm, I'm going to go look under, underneath this thing and I'm going I'm to find them, come back and say, hey, I didn't find anything. I say, all right, you're a computer, so keep looking there all the time, forever. Okay. So you look and you look and you look and then you find something. And hey, I found this roll of tape. All right. I don't care about rolls of tape. So, and tuning does not mean rolls of tape are stupid. That hunt is stupid. Forget about it. Tuning means, hey, keep looking there. And if you find a roll of tape, don't tell me about it. Tell me about something else. Right? That's what, that's what I mean by tuning. I'm sure all you guys are probably already on board with that. Your detection team if it is a team, maybe it's just one person, can handle X number of alerts in a, in a given day or week or whatever, whatever time frame you want to talk about. Like, and I want to use, I want to do a visual here with my hands, like say that's one alert, two alerts, like X alerts, right? This is how many alerts your team can handle during a given day. If the number of alerts that get generated by your tools is larger than what your team can handle, then you absolutely do. You need to tune it down, right? And get that below what their threshold is or at. If it becomes less than, and this is, I think, what people don't do. If it becomes less, then you need to hunt and introduce more. Because remember, 99% of the alerts are false positives. It's okay if you're introducing false positives, as long as you're hunting and tuning. And this is important because every time you do this, when you grow it and then you shrink it back down, what you're doing is you're introducing more coverage, right? I'm going to go in here and I'm looking, and I've tuned it. I've got the tape out. I've got the water bottle out. If something pops up in here, I'm going to know about it. And now I've got that under control. Now I'm going to go look over here, too. I've got these two points covered. And I'm going to do that over and over again. Every time I do, I'm going to introduce more, more coverage. So the metrics of how many false positives starts to matter, but in a different way, because your graph of false positive changes, right? It's this. It hunt and tune, hunt and tune, hunt and tune. It stays steady. This from here to here, this is how much work your analysts do. Go back to where I was talking about, uh, uh, so what do false positives mean to me as an analyst? It's what I do, right? I need things to look through. If I don't have very many things to look through, give me more. Go hunting, 
Go find new stuff. Fill it back up. It gets up here. 99% of these things are false positives. Tune it back down. That's the strategy that we're taking to try to increase our coverage. And so as you tune and tune and tune, and this is what the problem I was having with this graph, this is really what it's trying to tell me. This is your coverage of the attack surface. As you hunt and you tune, your chance, when you're starting out, your chance is low because you're not covering that much stuff. And as you introduce more coverage, then your chances of detecting, which is what this thing really represents to me, increases. So that's all well and good, right? 99% are false positive. You want to increase your coverage to detect. If you increase your coverage, you increase your alerts, of which 99% are false positives. As I was doing this then, I found another metric that I never even really thought of before. And then if there's any point in this slide that's like the most important point, this is the one that I really want to get through to everyone that's here. The metric is not um, how many false positives are there. The metric is if you already know that 99% of the alerts you're looking at are false positive, then when you're looking at that alert, how long did it take you to realize that what you were looking at is a false positive? Why is that important? Why is that metric important? I think it's important because detection, in my opinion, is really hard. You might, you might disagree. You might think, man, I go through all these alerts really fast and you know, detection is easy. In my opinion, detection is super freaking difficult. And I was talking about this. I say, like, this is how many alerts that your team can, can handle. And I think that really this is probably like going to be like this. And I don't mean that to be insulting. I mean because detection is hard. How many times did you, you know, you get all these alerts and you're like, I've seen this, I've seen this, I've seen this FP, FP, FP. You know, you wear out your F8 key. It doesn't even say F8 anymore. <laughs> and you're, <laughs> and you're, and, uh, and, but then you come to that one alert and you're like, I have absolutely no idea what the heck I'm looking at. Uh, it's a DNS request. Uh, the subdomain looks like it's Space64 encoded. I decode it. It's just a binary blob. XOR it. I don't know. And you spend maybe hours digging on this one alert when you've got all these other things to look through. It's, in, in my opinion, it's, it's pretty hard. This metric is the one to drive, right? And what I mean by that is this is what I need to improve. If I want to improve the detection capabilities of Ashland, what I need to do is improve this metric. I need to take the amount of time that it takes you to realize that you're wasting your time and bring it down to nothing. Because the smaller you can get that, the bigger you can get that. And the bigger you can get that, then the more alerts you can handle, the more alerts, the more false positives you can handle, the more coverage you can introduce. The more coverage you introduce, the better chances you, are, you have of actually alerting in the first place. So. What if I had a magical tool that somehow, for every alert, it gave the analyst enough information that he or she could quickly determine that it was a false positive? How would that affect things? Like I just said, you know, that would ultimately increase your chances of, uh, of detecting. So in half of presentation, that's the strategy, right? This is my thought process. This is why I'm trying to do what I'm doing. Three key things. 99% of the alerts I'm not going to respond to. You got to increase your coverage to get the attack surface. And the metric to drive is how long does it take you to realize you're wasting your time? Because there's a 99% chance that you probably are when you're reviewing that alert. So let's talk about alert triage. And we're getting into more of the tactical part of it, right? How do we do alert triage as human beings? And then at the end of this slide, I come to a conclusion that. I kind of I knew all along, but I, I didn't realize that that's what it was. You get that initial alert, and you analyze it, and you're looking at it. And in that alert, you're observing things that you identify. Like you remember it, or you know it, and you're like, oh, that, that, that's an IP address, right? You know in your mind you know what an IP address is, right? You identify these things, and then you take these things, and you research these things, and you build the case. Only now, I'm not building the case to say, that it's malicious, I'm building the case to say that it's false positive. Up until this point, every time I sit down and I'm looking at an alert, I'm trying to figure out, is this malicious? Is this malicious? I've changed that way of thinking now that I've thought about all this, because the much higher probability is that it's not going to be something I'm going to care about. So that's the case that I'm trying to build. 
And possibly as I'm doing this, I take that thing and I, and I take it and I research it and then the output of the analysis of the research, I'm probably going to find more things to dig on, right? Ad infinitum. And inevitably you're going to end up falling down rabbit holes. We all do. Where it just time just disappears. In the end, you get, it's hard to describe, you get these impressions. Right? You're looking at these things and you see these things and you see it and it imparts some impression on you like a, like a feeling. And the reason I bring that up is because I'll say detection is an art, right? And no, it actually really is. I think a lot of people use that to like get out of doing something somebody asked them to do. But it really is because your assessment of an alert is your gut feeling about it. At the very end, when you look at the alert and you come to your conclusion, there's no math behind it. You just feel that this is probably false positives, probably nothing, right? Or maybe you're super sure about it. Or maybe you're like, I don't know, right? There's no, there's no math to it at all. And that's a problem to solve. It's a difficult problem because it turns out that feelings in computers don't really mix that well. There's no way to impart that into Python code. I couldn't figure it out. Or that, that's what I'm trying to figure out. So, uh, how do I paint the picture of an alert such that when the analyst gets it, he can quickly figure out uh, what he's looking at? And honestly, I don't have an answer to that yet. This is, what I'm, this is what I'm trying to do. So introduce, oh, well, yeah, automation is key. Forgot about that bullet point. So introduce the tool that I'm working on. Uh, this is, um, we're calling it ACE, which stands for Analysis Correlation Engine. Um, I stole all this artwork. Any Netrunner players? Yes! All right. It's like, there's three. <laughs> so this is the custom piece of ice that I'm building for Ashlyn um, that's trying to solve the problem. And this is what I'm using to, try to drive the metric to get that time uh, to disposition to FP down to zero. So automation is key. When you're... Where I'm, uh, the next three slides, I'm going to talk about the, the tactics of, like, this is basically how I'm designing this tool. So I've already described, like, why I'm doing it. We've talked about how alerts, or how alert triage works, right? And we talked about, at the end, when you look at an alert, it's a feeling. So what kind of tool do I write in order to solve this problem? So I'm going to say, going forward, that an alert, when it comes in, it has what I call observables. An observable is something that has a type and it has a value, and optionally it has a time at which it was observed. So an, an example of that would be um, an IP address, right? That's a type, and the value is you know 32.52.6.12, whatever. And the time would be June 25th, 2015 at 12.05.02 UTC, something like that. That is an example of an observable. I observed this in this alert. Analysis is then performed on the observable. I'm going to take that IP address and I'm going to do something with it. What I do depends on the type, right? If it's an IP address, you know, as an analyst, when I get an IP address, I know, you know, there's things I can do with this. I can go uh, pull PCAP on it. I can put it into Splunk or do a Splunk search on the proxy logs, do something like that. And the analysis, as I do the analysis on the observable, that's going to generate more observables. So, the analysis, the, the things that perform the analysis um, represent something that was previously done manually. So in doing all this, what, what I've identified is that when you get an alert, if you're really going to dig on it, there's a lot of time wasted because you're just like clicking on things on your computer. You're taking something, you're copy pasting it into this other tool, look at the output. All right, that's interesting. Put this over here, Google it. All right, that's interesting. Back and forth, right? I'm all about automation. I say automate all the things. I'm going to automate all the things that the tech guys would manually do, the menial tasks, and have them already done so that when they get that alert, all that work has already been done. All the analysis has already been done. So all the modules that are running represent things that we do manually, and the modules know what to do with observables of type X, right? So I'll walk you through an example of that. Here's this, I have an observable, and it's a type IP address. And 
say, hey, I am the PCAP extraction module guy. I know what to do with an IP address. I'm going to take that IP address and I'm going to go to all of our sensors that are running net sniff and G, and I'm going to run TCP jump with a BPF filter set to this IP address, and I'm going to select only the files modified within like a two minute range. And I'm going to pull all that PCAP back, and here's an observable of type file. And something says, oh, you're an observable of type file? I'm the bro file extraction from the PCAP module, right? I'm going to take that PCAP, I'm going to run bro on it, and I got some code that extracts all these files, and hey, here's a freaking ton of files. And, oh, you have a file, and it's an executable? I'm the sandbox analysis module guy. I'm going to go take this, I'm going to run this file in the sandbox, and wait. And, hey, look, it reached out to us, they tried to reach out to an IP address. Oh, you have an IP address? I'm the uh, guy that looks at IP addresses that did not come with the original alert, and I'm going to take it, and I'm going to run it in Splunk, looking for any proxy request to this IP address. And, oh, hey, somebody actually did try to go to this IP address. And here's their user ID, right? It just goes on and on and on. And all these things that you would do if you felt compelled to do it, like if you looked at that alert and you're like, eh, you're not going to go through all that trouble doing all that work, so I'll just go ahead and do it for you in case there's something to find, because there might be. Mod the modules can do any anything that I want them to do. It's all just a bunch of Python code, so it's going to be literally like whatever, whatever we can automate. And then recursion with limits for the win. So I was talking about observable, I'm going to analyze it, it's going to generate more observables, I'm going to analyze all these things, et cetera, et cetera, until either I hit a limit or there's nothing else to observe. Now we get into more of the tricky part. As you're triaging an alert, you're visually seeing things and then you might be triggering memories on those things, right? You might see an IP address and you're like, ah, oh, I know what that IP address is. That IP address is one of our Koala scanners. Oh, that's something I definitely want to know when I'm looking at an alert. If I don't happen to know that, then I'm going to end up wasting my time if I spend a lot of time investigating this one alert. I want to note it at the very beginning. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a callless tagging module that's going to go out and first it's going to try to find a way to identify what all our callless machines are without depending on asset management. And then I'm going to take that list, and for every IP address that we ever see, I'm going to compare it to the list, and if it's one of those, I'm going to stamp it with Qualys, and off it goes. So that when the analyst gets the alert with all that analysis, there's going to be a little tag pointing to something that says, hey, this is a Qualys IP, and immediately he's going to start thinking, oh, I need to look at that first, right? Am I wasting my time here? Because there's a 99% chance that I am. So the analysis and the observables can all be tagged in that way. And the intention is to impart somehow that emotion of whatever it's supposed to be. And then tags can then be assigned a priority. And then the sum priority of the tags will represent the priority of the entire alert. So what I mean by that is, you know, okay, Qualys. But hey, this IP address, this is a domain controller. A domain con our core domain controller is involved in this alert somehow. Right? I'm going to tag that as domain controller, and I'm going to assign a priority of, oh my god, to that tag. <laughs> so that when the analyst gets it, uh, and it's you know sort by priority, it's at the top of the list, that still already works, and he already knows he's dealing with the d domain controller. And really, this is, like, this is the hardest part. So this is where you're getting into, how do I impart, how do I impart that feeling to the user through a program. Somehow I've got to get this thing so that, like there's going to be a freaking ton of analysis. There's a ton of possible things that you can do. And what we're doing is, um, this is, this system is actually like live in production. I'm a kind of programmer who just like starts typing it in and starts using it. Um, I don't test, well I test in production, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so what, what, what we're doing is that when we get an alert and uh, when we end up spending a lot of time on that alert, we go back and we look and we think, all right, what, what were the things that we had to do to come to the conclusion of false positive or, or not? What are the things that we had to do to come to that conclusion? And those things that we had to do, we then look at and we say, all right, is there any way to automate that? And if we can't automate it, then that turns into a, a Python module inside the system. And then the next time that that situation arises, it's already done. We don't have to do it again. So we're rinsing and repeating that process. We're introducing more modules. But the problem that I'm finding is that the more that we do that, the more data 
Like you just have a freaking data overload. There's so much analysis that you can do and there's so much output of this stuff. How do I impart, how do I take that and communicate to the user that this is what you're looking at? So I'm not sure what this is going to end up looking at, like at the end. I know what it looks like now and it's not probably not what it's going to end up being, but um, that, is, that is the goal. So that's my presentation. Does anybody have any questions about this? Yeah, so ACE is basically, it's, I would, it's not a sim, but it kind of acts like one. So we have all these other tools that we've written, right? We've got all this stuff that's going into Splunk. We've got things that run searches on Splunk, and if it finds stuff, it sends alerts to ACE. We've got uh, things that listen on SMTP, things that tail the bro, tail, the bro logs, um, just random stuff like that. And it's all feeding alerts into this one system. And the idea is that rather than having a sim where it says, hey, you need to have all these conditions before we alert, we're going to take that one single condition and we're going to start spidering out through our analysis of observables and hopefully hit all those points, all those on the attack surface, and then somehow present that to the user in such a way, like what Harlan was saying in clusters, right? This is everything that happened and this is how they're all related. What do you think? That's the goal of it. Sure. Yes, yeah, yeah. That's uh, that is turned out to be because it, it we were doing it. I was like, hey, that would be a great idea, and that turned out to be an analysis module. Here's the alert. Here's all the observables. Here's all the alerts that were related to all these observables of, of these types. How big's your team? Uh, three, three, six, six, seven. Is that right? Seven. Yeah. So, developer Nate Nate Hosroth does Intel. Um, and we got a we got another guy here that's doing the last presentation on DLP. So he's our architect. Um, and then we got three guys in Lexington to do um, like all the Splunk type stuff, a uh, detect guy, and like we got a guy that's been working there for 25 years. So you can give him an IP address, and he's like, oh yeah, that's the router in Sydney. <laughs> cool, dude. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. I don't. It just happens. Then I deal with it. So, I mean, that's a. So, you introduce these rules that generate like tons of false positives. I've built tools before that did that. So, I kind of have some experience with how do you handle like tons and tons and tons of alerts. So, that was an important aspect in designing the tool. But it still happens. And when it happens, you just have to deal with it. Cool. Anybody else? I see. No, not yet. Sounds like I should. <laughs> Have you looked at that? Okay. Okay, what's your name? Justin. Okay, I'll, I'll talk to you after this. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's come up a few times. Um, definitely, like, like in, in the, in, internally it's all just JSON type stuff. So I was thinking about like how do I export this stuff and like graph it, like maybe different types of graphs. So yeah, I'll probably explore that, that kind of stuff. Definitely in trying to figure out how do, how do I present it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so, sometimes it ended up being in, infinite. So it was really just trial and error, um, trying to figure out what types of relationships end up just recursing forever and putting like just integer limits on, on those. But you know, there's also like resource limits, so I can't like do everything I want to do all the time because I don't have infinite resources. So you know, there's limits that I have to put here and there. But yeah, sure. It, yeah, we're working on that. We, we want it to be um, because I've written, I wrote a tool before um, 
that previous job that they let me open source it and then someone else took that and like ran with it and now we're using his tool based on my tool to actually do detection. So in my opinion, open source is freaking awesome and, and we're working on getting the business to give us the check mark and, and go forward with it. But then I have to separate out all of our, a lot of the stuff that I'm writing is going to be custom specific for Ashland. Um, but if I can get that separated and get it out there, I definitely would like people to help me work on it. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yep. Cool. Yeah. Ben. Hey. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yes, definitely. Because how long does it take you to work the alert depends on, okay, when did you start? And did you take a break? And when you're working on it, did you get sidetracked? Like you always do. You know, how, how do you measure that? And really it's been, so far, it's just been the one Part of the detection part, 
right? So we've got all these other tools that I haven't even talked about that go out and pull all those things in and look for all the different kinds of things. We've got a lot of all that information or automation with detection where we're taking, like we've got all our atomic indicators and grids and all that being exported and all these tools and it's all looking for all the things. We got hunts that we do, I was talking about, where we go out, we do the hunt, awesome, okay, automate it, run it over and over again. And it's all using all those logs and stuff. And all that stuff, only the alerts go into AZ, not logs. Valuable. I would say definitely a network, all the network stuff that we have. We have network sensors in place where we're running um, Snort and Bro and SFMU to report traffic. Those are super valuable, especially as part of the analysis to go out and pull all the PCAP. When you get that alert and you go over and you've got all these IP addresses and you already have all the PCAP associated with those IP addresses at the time the alert was created, like that by itself is freaking awesome. And it helps me, like, oh yeah. Um, I think the other big thing is so there isn't competitors at all. So um, getting all the logs into one place where we can query them is super powerful. So we use that pretty adequately. Cool. All right. Um, I'll be around.